Our country is facing serious times calling for serious leadership. But I hope that whoever is our next president, that he's a man who can laugh at himself and get the American people to laugh with him. This is Jerry's show. <laughs> President, I've just met a young man who inspired me, and I believe that someday he has a good chance to be president of the United States. Jerry Litton was securing his place in history. From his ranch in Chillicothe, Missouri, Jerry Litton had built a multi-million dollar cattle business. Litton was the national spokesman for the future farmers of America and the breeder who made Charolais cattle internationally famous. He was the United States Congressman Tip O'Neill, described as the greatest freshman congressman he'd ever seen. He was the man Jimmy Carter said would one day be President of the United States. Litton was loved, almost worshipped, by his fellow Missourians. He had fast become a political hero just four years after announcing his first run for public office. The job is a public one, but the decision is a very personal one to make. And I know that to serve as a U.S. congressman will involve many sacrifices on the part of myself and my family. Who would have guessed yet, just how great the, the personal sacrifice would be? On election and night, perfect. August 3rd, 1976, just hours away from winning the primary race for the U.S. Senate, Jerry Litton and his wife, Sharon, and his two children, Linda and Scott, died in a plane crash, along with their pilot and his son. The story of Jerry Litton is the story of a strong-willed and hard-working man. He did not inherit his wealth, and he was not handed any public office. He grew up in a modest farm community, an only child, struggling with shyness. Jerry's rise to fame and fortune would be an uphill battle all the way. It was his training in the future farmers of America that helped Jerry gain self-confidence and discipline. Only two years after joining the FFA at his father's encouragement, Jerry's Hereford Bull won grand champion in state competition for the junior class. On the same day, Jerry won eight more ribbons for a group of hogs he and his mother raised on synthetic milk. From that day forward, the driven youngster won ribbon after ribbon for his livestock projects. Bolstered by his continued success in the FFA, Jerry ventured into public speaking and radio announcing. By the time he was a teenager, Jerry and his future wife, Sharon, started their own radio show called Platter Party. This uh, idea of juvenile delinquency again, uh, do you think it's uh, the parents' fault or maybe the children's? Oh, I think it's a little bit of both. A little bit of both. I think that's a wise viewpoint on your part. Thanks for talking with us. Let's get back to some more of the records we have and share you the mic's yours. A big song with a little title. It's Fever. By the time he was in high school, the once shy Lytton summoned the courage to stand in front of large audiences and tell the FFA story again and again. The practice of speaking on behalf of the FFA helped him win first place in the regional speech contest. The young Lytton became so admired for his public speaking that he was asked to help other FFA leaders develop the skill. Remember that the simplest, easiest, and quickest way to get people to listen, the surest way to hold their attention, is to use illustrations. Jesus Christ revealed his message in stories. Jerry was learning how to inspire an audience. In culture report, we learn that over three billion tons of valuable topsoil has been removed each year from our farmlands through action of water and wind. This soil in a foot square column would reach 600 times around the earth. It would make a pyramid close to a mile square at the base and two miles high. The most important influence in Lytton's early life were his parents, Mildred and Charlie. 
Jerry recalled his parents' courage and their will to overcome hard times in one of his first political commercials. I know of a farm couple born not many years ago and not many miles from right here. They had to borrow money to get married and borrow money to buy their farm. He worked part-time as a truck driver in a truck gravel pit. He helped an older trucker one day and had the misfortune of being thrown beneath the wheels and crippled. But he was more than crippled. He was an invalid the first seven years of his married life. The only income they had were 11 milk cows that the wife milked. And that wasn't enough. She trapped on the side. And they had the misfortune of getting a skunk in the trap. She'd help him out of bed, and they'd go down to the creek, and together would get the skunk out. Those were difficult times. 1943, he was back on his feet, and this time a hay baler accident sent him to Mayo's clinic. They told him he wouldn't live. He went back to the farm, and his wife kept him alive with injections she gave him every four hours, every day, and every week, and every month, and every year, or two years. And then in 1945, their farm home nearly paid for with little insurance. They stood in the lawn arm in arm and watched it burn to the ground. 1946, everything they had invested in hogs. And that was the year that erysipelas came along, and that disease wiped them out. Once again, they had absolutely nothing. But today, they're successful. Today, they have their farm. They're two of the finest people in the world. I know, because that's my mom and dad. Jerry's heart was in the Lytton Ranch and what it represented to his family. Still a teenager, Jerry became convinced his family should breed a rare stock of cattle called Charolais. So persuasive were Jerry's arguments that his father took him to Texas to look at the strange white cattle. Believing the Charolais was the cattle of the future, young Lytton took out a bank loan for the purchase of their first Charolais bull. Jerry's supportive father co-signed the loan. Jerry threw himself into the family business, especially after graduating from college. He'd majored in agriculture journalism at the University of Missouri. Jerry's background in journalism enabled him to create a barrage of public relations campaign to promote the Lytton Ranch. One of Jerry's most ingenious feats was attracting network anchorman Chet Huntley to narrate a film about the ranch. This breed originated in France centuries ago. But because of wars and shipping restrictions, they have only recently appeared in the United States. Charlet are big, beefy animals that are world famous. One of the finest Charlet herds in the country is the Lytton Charlet Ranch at Chillicothe, Missouri. No one is better qualified to tell you about the Lytton breeding program than Jerry Lytton. Jerry? Thanks, Chet. Our business is to produce genetically superior breeding stock to enter herds around the globe and to add more efficient pounds of the right kind to their cattle. The Lytton Ranch is a family enterprise. Here are the senior partners of the team, Charlie and Mildred Lytton to many, mom and dad to me, and friends to many who they have met and worked with in the growth of this herd and the great expansion of the breed. Lytton promoted the family's ranch in yet another film called Some Old Farm Problems Can Be Solved by Electronics. The average value of our calves is nearly $8,000. We have one bull, Super Sam, that's worth nearly $400,000. With values like this attached to these cattle, it's obvious that we have to maintain close surveillance of them, especially at calving time. When a cow approaches calving time, she's brought into a calving stall such as this, where we maintain 24-hour closed-circuit television observation of the cows with cameras such as this, with monitors in our office and in our home. The Lytton Ranch became one of the most sophisticated ranching operations in the country and a multi-million dollar business. Having persuaded the cattle industry to buy Charolais, Lytton was now ready to convince the voters in rural Missouri that he would be a great spokesman for the heart of America. His decision to run for public office was no surprise to those who knew him. Lytton had chosen this course as a teenager 
after meeting a president from Independence, Missouri. He talked about that turning point in one of his political commercials. Well, you know, when I was 19 years old, I had a 15-minute appointment with Harry Truman that lasted an hour or so. And I challenge any 19-year-old boy to spend that long with Harry Truman, not come out of his office ready to run for something. Truman had advised Lytton to first become financially independent before running for public office. Advice Jerry had followed by building the Lytton Ranch with his parents. Truman also influenced Lytton's style of politicking. I just don't enjoy going around kissing the backside of political bosses. I take my campaign to the people. I did it the first time. I got reelected by 80% without their support. I'm running for the Senate now. Somebody said, gee, you're not getting endorsements. Well, we're not really spending that kind of time trying to get political bosses to be with us. I'm spending my time with the people. They're the ones that are going to vote, and they're the ones I want to represent anyway. Lytton's maverick style of going straight to the people with this message is best seen on his own television ever. series called ever Dialogue ever. with Lytton. So skilled was Lytton in using TV to promote his political career that he became the show's man. editor, actually selecting the camera shots. Man that I on Dialogue, Lytton was able to speak to hundreds of thousands of TV viewers. He also was positioning himself alongside the nation's most powerful leaders, even presidential candidates. They were quick to praise Lytton. Well, can I just say to Jerry Lytton that he made this possible. It was his idea. And this is a town meeting. And Jerry, I want to compliment you. This is a great service that you've performed for the constituency here for your state. And quite honestly, some of us that didn't do, do it are jealous. <laughs> yeah, it's a nasty thing. <laughs> This program has been on television now for two years, and we have been drawing a better rating on prime time by 16% than Monday Night Football for all seasons. You've got to be kidding. So I knew we'd outdraw them today. <laughs> I never have seen such, such a remarkable <coughs> demonstration of what our nation ought to be. As to see a thousand or so people assembled here. I'm very proud of Jerry Litton. I, I know of no congressman who's come so fast. Uh, since the Missile Age. Uh. And I'm proud to say that recently I have been voting for farm issues and I want to thank Jerry Litton for educating me along those lines. Litton studio audience, members of the Jerry Litton Congressional Club, as Jerry called it, returned to see him month after month. They flocked to hear Litton's storytelling and humor, his way of explaining government. Room. <laughs> that reminds me, the, the, the Russian came over here, and we'll get this question, the Russian came over here to buy some big generators, and he went into the plant, and they get it, uh, spent a great deal of time looking at the generators, expensive ones. Twelve o'clock came, and the whistle blew in the factory, and all the American workers went out to eat lunch, and, and uh, the Russian said, you better shut the gate, you're losing your workers. And the American <laughs> said, don't worry, they'll come back. So it's at one o'clock, the whistle blow, and all the workers will come back. The whistle blew, they all came back. The American sat down and said, now, how many generators do you want? The Russian said, forget the generators, give me three dozen of those whistles. <laughs> and I recall one of my favorite stories that I love to tell because I enjoy taking a shot at our big friends from New York City and the Big Apple. The farm boy from, from Missouri that went to New York City, the boy's name was Fred Hicks, and he met a banker back there by the name of James A. Cobb. And Mr. Cobb talked to the Hicks boy for a long while. And finally, son, he said, where are you from? He said, Missouri. Tom said, you farm boy, he said, that's right. He said, what's your name? He said, Hicks. And he laughed so loud, you could hear him all the way down to the hall. He said, son, do you know what we do with Hicks in New York City? The boy said, no, sir, but I know what we do with Cobbs back in Missouri. <laughs> uh, I was in Chicago airport the other day, and I went into a men's room, and there's a machine there. You push a button, and hot air comes out to dry your hands, and some smart aleck had pasted a message across the top of the machine. It said, push here to hear from your congressman. <laughs> What signs are there that the world is avoiding the conflicts that have plagued us through history and started to work together as a unit? Them's the kind of questions that hurt politics. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about us meeting with the people, talking, relating, mm -hmm. as opposed to political rallies. Could we get a show of hands of those who consider themselves Republicans or independents? Would you do that? Well, that's a mighty good, uh, that's a frightening number. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, 
Ruthen attracted more media coverage in just four years than most congressmen ever experience. He was especially known as the champion of the farmers and appeared on national television as their spokesman. Sure, food is higher today. So is everything else. So is the price of a car. So is rent. So is hospital care. So are wages. Before we start condemning the price of food, let's compare it a little bit and say compared to what? When President Nixon singled out only farmers in what many saw as an unfair income tax investigation, Lytton fought for the farmers' rights. The IRS is there to, to do what we all thought it was there to do all along, and that's to collect taxes to run our country and not to collect information on the private citizens of this country. Jerry Litton. By the time Litton is 38, he feels ready to become a senator. He decides to enter one of history's most difficult campaigns. Litton's name recognition is almost zero except to his own rural constituency. But again, Lytton uses television to take his campaign to the people. He makes this race one of the most hotly contested campaigns ever held in Missouri. Well, how would you describe your political philosophy then? Well, I'm liberal on education, on programs for the elderly, because I think both have been overlooked in America. I'm conservative on welfare and fiscal responsibility. I'm liberal on programs for the blacks and the minorities, but I'm conservative on busing because I don't think it'll work. Support Jerry Litton, Democrat, for United States Senator. For 10 months, the populist candidate continues to keep up his daily 18-hour schedule. Polls say Litton almost is caught up with his opponents when the last dialogue show is taped with his wife. Sharon keeps her own hectic pace, traveling around the state and serving as campaign treasurer. With victory so close, Litton decides to give his last ounce of strength to the campaign. He had never lost a campaign. He would not lose this one. We will have dialogue with Litton again next month. And at that time, I'll either be a congressman on his way out or a senator on the way in. And I hope that you come, participate as you've done today, as you've done for the last four years. If you can't come, I hope that you tune in on television throughout the state of Missouri as we continue to bring government to the people. Thank you very much. Destined for greatness, Lytton seemed to have it all. The keen intelligence, an unwavering drive, the political savvy, and a magnetic touch with the common man. Characteristics that would have allowed Lytton to withstand the political tides and rise to high office. As the plane took off on election night, heading for his campaign headquarters in Kansas City, Lytton only knew the first returns looked promising. He would never know. He had won the campaign by an astounding margin of almost two to one. Historians would refer to the Lytton political force as the miracle campaign. It may be a long time before we see the likes of Jerry Lytton again, but his inspirational life, what it stood for, and the dreams he fought for, that is Lytton's legacy to us. Well, I really don't think there'll ever be another Jerry Litton. There'll be great men from other places, but nobody will be that close to. I feel shocked, lost, disbelieving. But I remember I wrote him a note one time before he went into politics, and I said something about, Jerry, I wish you'd go into politics. We feel so lost without Jack and Bobby Kennedy. And he wrote back, well, they are gone, and you can't keep looking back to them.